Yeah, so usually how I like to start these conversations is really about individuals' journeys. And usually when I speak to, to people, they're really into something that they're going to dedicate a lot of their time and, and a lot of their life to. And sometimes, and most of the time when I talk to people, you know, they're, they're doing something that will really define their life's work in a lot of ways. Um, so I think it's important to kind of start with a little bit of the journey. And, and for you two, let's talk about your journey into impact investing, right? And sort of what, what brought to, to that in your life and what was it, what was it like to start, start the initiative um, and just take us along that journey and either one can, can start first. If the, it doesn't really matter, but let, let, let's start with the journey of getting into impact investing just in general. For me, the, the, the journey and kind of really, really started when I gained control of my inheritance. So I come from a business family. Um, I'm third generation. Uh, and so I sort of, I got control over all of my assets when I was 21. Um, so mm-hmm. that's about 15 years ago now. And so <laughs> sort of overnight uh, became an investor, <laughs> <laughs> whether or not I liked it. Um, and so at that point, what I inherited was a financial portfolio. So, you know, li- largely liquid investments. I was in college at the time and I was actually, I was studying African history and I was always really interested in international development. And um, I thought maybe that was what I wanted to go into and sort of development economics. And I thought, I just thought that was really, really fascinating. And this was at a time also, and when I was in school, when sort of, sort of micro credit market based solution right. um this this was sort of the 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 talk of the day and in development communities that you know aid is dead and it's really about business and private sector um sort of pushing development metrics forward mm-hmm. um, so I kind of, I, I always thought that space was really interesting and really fascinated, really fascinated by it. But, you know, this was 2005. And so the idea of impact investing as sort of a sector um, or, or a type of finance was really in its infancy. Um, yep. And it was still a couple of years later that actually the, the the term got coined. And so I started to get more kind of uh, involved in philanthropy and funding some of these market-based solutions, but through philanthropic vehicles. Mm-hmm. Over sort of the next few years, what I kept getting frustrated by was, you know, really the, the philanthropy is, is great and can definitely, you know, push things forward, but where most of the money in the world is, including, you know, in my own assets was in my investment portfolio. That was really where there were more resources um, and more assets to push forward. And so kind of starting really in sort of 2007, 2008 was when I turned my attention to my investment portfolio as really the lever of impact. And then, you know, over the next several years, and here we are, you know, today uh, with sort of Blue Haven Initiative fully, fully formed, what we have done is built out a single family office that is focused from the ground up on impact investing. So mm-hmm. this is all of our assets. This isn't a carve out. It's not, it's not a part of a family foundation. This is everything. It's our whole family office. And so what we do is we look across asset classes um, and we try and find the most impactful investments that we can find that also perform as they should financially, given the asset class that they're in. And so really what this means is we are looking for um, impact where companies and investment funds are the best way to scale that particular type of impact. So this isn't the case with everything, right? Um, Right. I think early childhood education is tough to make market rate. (laughs) Um, So you know, what, what, what we've become good at is, is looking at where are investment opportunities and market rate investing, uh, where can it have the most impact and where do you want to see that kind of private sector scale of certain kinds of solutions. And so, um, so that's what we've built. Um, but yeah, it really all kind of started because I had a pool of assets to invest and I wanted to take responsibility for that as an inheritor. Right, right. Um, pay attention to the environmental and social impact of what all those assets are doing as I steward them to the next generation. Um, I had the, the luck of growing up in a house, household where 
both my parents were involved in different ways in what we now call impact investing on the professional side of trying to place investments overseas for international institutions to fight poverty, as well as on the institutional policy side where my, my uh, mother was the first college president to divest her endowment from apartheid holdings in South Africa back wow. in the 1970s. And then she also ended up uh, running one of the largest foundations in the United States and led their uh, work on impact investing from the main part of the endowment, not part of the, not the philanthropic portfolio as well. So I was brought up knowing that you can do well in business and serve a purpose. And uh, then I also inherited resources as well and uh, was uh, already involved in screening portfolios and in placing investments in, in uh, purpose-built companies for impact investing purposes and uh, before Liesl and I met. So it was actually impact investing was something we bonded over <laughs> right, yeah. very early on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the idea that somehow, you know, your right hand should know, should know what the left hand is doing, that you, you know, if you're trying to make a, make a difference in the world, you should be paying attention to how you're making and investing money and how you're growing businesses and not just uh, how you're using your time or being philanthropic. So it's a core, a core passion, core passion of ours. And I think, you know, as, as Liesl and I have looked back to some of our family business stories that we're most proud of involve entrepreneurs in our families or investors in our family who invested in businesses that somehow are solving a key social problem. Mm -hmm. And, and those are the businesses they're most proud of. So I think we were extra motivated by, by that as well. And thinking as we are stewarding resources for future generations, we'd like to be able to be part of solutions, not just uh, in addition to doing financially well, actually being part of solving key problems. So this is also the first impact investing love story. I think you <laughs> can say this is the first one ever, right? Since we, the coin was just, the, the term was just coined, I think, right? When you guys were, uh, <laughs> we're, we're coming together. Um, um, so I, I guess when we talk about, you know, Blue Haven in, in general and sort of the, the initiative, when you wanted to start it, was the idea already laid out sort of the mission and framework already laid out and you know exactly what regions of the world you want to invest in, what, what were the certain sectors you wanted to invest in? Let's start something, right? And then we'll, we'll sort of figure out what it was. Or was there, was there a real plan from the beginning and then day one, you were sort of just hit the ground running? What we did agree to and what has, you know, continued to be the guiding star in all of this was that we want to do this with 100% of our portfolio. So often what will happen with a family office or a foundation or, you know, any type of kind of asset owner is they'll shave off something. So they'll, they'll create an entity that, you know, they'll sort of take a portion of their assets and they'll put it in an LLC that does impact investing, or they'll put it in a foundation that does this, or they'll right, start a fund. Right. But it never bubbles up to actually the head, head family office. Um, and so like you even take like, you know, Bill Gates, there's Gates Foundation, there's Breakthrough Energy Ventures, there's lots of different initiatives, but nobody really knows if it actually bubbles up to the head family office. Um, and there's always a lot of, it's very, most of those sort of big family offices are incredibly opaque. Um, so they'll talk to you about like one part of their philanthropy or their investing, but not everything. And one of the things that, that we really wanted to do from day one is not do that, but actually like really, really <laughs> holistically integrate this so that we don't have the ability to create silos because we're doing it from the head office to begin with. And so what that though really meant was we couldn't be too prescriptive because, you know, and also at that point, the universe of impact investing fund managers with track record and things like that was, was still more nascent. So what we really kind of said was, listen, we want to do this across asset classes. So first of all, we want to do this with everything. Secondly, we want to build a diversified portfolio. So, you know, like any prudent investor, we can't be 100% in early stage VC. We can't be 100% right, in, right. you know, public equities. We want to build a really, you know, a diversified portfolio that makes sense 
from a liquidity standpoint, from a risk standpoint, and from a diversification standpoint. So that was kind of the task. And so really in the beginning, it was about, okay, let's just start kind of marching through the asset classes. So we set our asset allocation and then we said, all right, now how do we find best in class managers Mm -hmm. that have an impact or sustainability theme that also meet the characteristics of the asset class and sub-asset class that we're, that we're filling. And so that takes us in a lot of kind of interesting directions. And so we do a lot of renewable energy project finance um, and infrastructure finance. There's things like timber funds, there's, you know, startups uh, or, or, you know, funds that are in the biotech space that are solving all kinds of uh, sort of healthcare issues. There's, we really span um, sectors and industries in order, in sort of pursuit of that holistic goal. Um, and so we not only have the financial diversification we're looking for, but it's also impact diversification. Right. And so that's sort of how we built out the portfolio. But then in 2014, we took a chunk of our private equity portfolio and built sort of an in-house evergreen venture fund. Mm. Um, and that one we were more strategic about. So that is focused on sort of fintech and logistics companies in sub-Saharan Africa, sort of seed through series D. And yeah, I can talk more about that one, but that, that really, we, we, we have a stronger thesis and, you know, is more research driven and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So quick question before, is it, are there many family offices dedicated to specifically impact investing, right? Like you said, it might be a, a, you know, a part or a wing of a family office, but are you guys the biggest like family office dedicated to just impact investing? I don't either. It's hard to know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I wouldn't want to claim that. Sure. Um, but there are starting to be more. I mean, there's even a network of family offices mm -hmm. that are focused on impact investing that we're involved with called The Impact. Um, yep. But yeah, they're popping up. But family offices are, are quite quite secretive often. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, it's tough to know. And, and I guess with the, if we want to go, I'd like to dig in a little bit to, to, the, to, the, to the venture side of things, if you don't mind, because, it, you know, it's so weird. I, I've talked to, just this past month, I've talked to about, you know, five or six people doing some really incredible things in Africa. And it's such a, an, an inspiring, you know, region and, and very just optimistic. I think so many people talk about, you know, China and Asia and, and uh, even, you know, Brazil, South America as, as sort of these up and coming sort of regions, obviously China is, is no longer up and coming or there, but Africa is sort of this, to me, just this just giant, just sleeping giant, like waiting to really just burst at the seams with innovation and entrepreneurship, um, just from those I talked to. Do you see the same thing? And, and is it was that the reason to, to focus on Africa with the with the venture side of things? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the, from an investment perspective, what we got very excited about, I mean, and it was also kind of coming off of, I had spent time there working at microfinance institutions and what kind of got me really excited. So I was sort of around in, in parts of East Africa, particularly when um, M-Pesa and mobile money yeah. really took off yeah. and it was the first yeah. place in the world where mobile money took off. Yeah. And it's, it has an incredibly high penetration of mobile money. And so what I got excited about is that you've got a sort of large young population, you've got high penetration and increasingly high penetration of smartphones. You have very high penetration of mobile money um, and pretty shockingly bad incumbent banking systems and financial services. So to me, particularly from a FinTech perspective, you've got ingredients there that I think are really, really interesting. The other thing is, is that it is a, it is a, although you've got some really large economies, right? Like Nigeria and South Africa and even Kenya um, mm -hmm. and like Egypt, regionally speaking, and, and it, it's, it's actually kind of hard to um, expand into multiple countries for a whole host of different reasons. And sure. so it's actually then as from an investment standpoint as well, we see it as not 
a, a little bit less risky that, you know, a huge incumbent is going to come in and just blitzkrieg everybody and be well-funded. The, the mm -hmm. individual markets are really hard to do. So we think the acquisition story for fintechs is going to be higher. And so, I mean, we've just seen that play out with one of our one of our investments um, in Paystack, where Stripe came in. Stripe, and oh yes, I, I saw yeah. that the other day, and I was, I was, I, I reached out to uh, DMing like Paystack people and, and just, you know, yeah. them, just congratulating them. And I was like, Stripe is just to me, Stripe is one of the, is probably the most right now. I think it's the, it's one of the top five companies in the world right now. Yeah, I think every move that they make has been just aces, and, and I. I can't wait for them to go public so I can actually buy shares. <laughs> but uh, but no, I, I saw that and I was like, gosh, they just they just get it right, you know. When, when they do acquisition stuff, I mean, they just see the market so well, and, and that's that's great because I mean, Stripe is just the type of company you want to get acquired by. I, I think yeah. because I think you know oh, that. Totally. So yeah, so Paystack, uh, uh, we invested in a few years ago, um, and so. Yeah, so that was um, so we're 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 just sort of beginning to see that there's been more M and A activity on the continent this year, and investors are sort of starting to take notice. So that was really, I mean, what we liked is yeah, there's huge mobile money penetration, extremely fragmented, if at all, incumbent services, and uh, and a, and, a, and a large population of people who want it and increasingly can access those sorts of services through their phones. And so that's why we are long on fintech in sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> and, and, and just to just to piggyback real quick on, on Paystack, that is sort of would you say it's sort of merchant services or is it like the Venmo or is it both, right? Is it, is it sort of square and Venmo combined? It is basically. And one of the great things is like, anytime you see Shola like pitching, it's, he literally says, this is the stripe for Nigeria. Yeah, <laughs> like it's basically awesome. the same thing. Um, and this is to my point of like, instead of stripe going in and saying, we're just going to compete. I love it. Right. The market is different enough where they're like, eh, let's, why don't we acquire? And so that's, that, that is, that is part of our thesis is that there will be more acquisitions than, you know, big boys coming in and crowding out local companies. That's our, that's what we hope anyway. No, I think, I think the other part of the Africa story is that there has been a long tradition of entrepreneurship uh, across the continent and it uh, has gotten overlooked a little bit by the you know, excitement behind the Asia story and the South Asia story. But it's there, the talent is there. And because solving challenges across dozens and dozens and dozens of individual nations is complicated, it has made it challenging for, I think, US investors to get involved early. But we saw there an opportunity if we partnered with, with entrepreneurs doing the work of building businesses in a somewhat challenging environment for scale, and they were able to be successful, then it would be an advantageous position over the long term, and we'd be creating real impact. You know, I would also say the dollar can go very far in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of creating impact because you are off trying to create value for people at the middle and lower ends of the income spectrum in a place where the middle and the lower end of the income spectrum is quite low globally. And so the same amount of equity going into solving problems in the subcontinent can go further to solving problems often. And so we saw that as another interesting reason for us to, to devote equity because we thought we could make a competitive return and have the dollars go further in terms of, in terms of impact. You know, let's say a company like Paystack, which is solving uh, financial transaction issues for small businesses, uh, is hugely beneficial. You know, the, the, for those who, who aren't sort of familiar with it, the, the situation in Nigeria and many countries ac across the continent is you have multiple different forms of payment being generated. It's very hard for like a, a PayPal to just come in mm -hmm. in the market given the complexities. So they, so Paystack had to solve uh, multitudes of real problems on the ground with how businesses were processing payments. And by willing- It's really, to it's really hard to do. It's, it's really, really hard, hard to do. Yeah, so by willing to being weighed into the complexity, solving real problems, really making a difference for the ability of small businesses to have a, uh, a more stable and stronger platform which to grow. You know, it's exciting to be part of. Is there any other portfolio, portfolio companies that, that you could share? Maybe that that's, uh, you know, that maybe not as, as successful yet as Paystack, but 
you know, one, and I always ask people this, like some of your, your, you know, your favorites and it's like, oh, I can't decide what favorite child I have. Right. But, <laughs> um, yeah. but it's like, I guess what ones that, that, you know, really stick out to you and you're super op optimistic about. Oh, I mean, I think that, that, yeah, there's lots of them and they're on their, on, um, on our, on our website. And I should also, you know, uh, shout out to our managing director of ventures, Lauren Cochran, who, who runs that portfolio and is the one who gets all the credit. Um, right. but, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's ones like, um, Twiga foods that's in there that many people know about that does, um, it's basically a, a logistics platform for, uh, fresh fruit and veg distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, although they're moving into other product lines as well, and just just increased efficiencies with sort of how they move things around and connect vendors to farms. There's another one that I'm excited about that uh, we've just invested in earlier this year called Field Intelligence, um, and they are uh, a pharmaceutical logistics company based out of Nigeria, um, but expanding into other markets, and 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 their product called Shelf Life. Uh, you know, helps pharmacies with um, sort of local independent pharmacies with inventory and product management and um, sort of financing inventory as well. Um, and so, which, as you can imagine, you know, is, is particularly important in the middle of a pandemic sure. to make yeah. sure that pharmacies are properly stocked. And so those are a couple, but there's lots. We've got some, you know, wonderful pay-as-you-go solar with MCOPA mm. and PEG. And yeah, lots of, um, lots of exciting ones in there. I, I always look at it as it that, you know, a lot of parts of the world, you know, kind of have the benefit right now of, of sort of like leapfrogging what developing nations sort of did wrong, right? And not wrong, but maybe it's just, it, it's slower, right? Like our banking system here is, is, is very slow, right? Very slow to innovate. You're seeing, you know, that sector get disrupted here with FinTech because, you know, banks have traditionally just moved very, very slow with innovation. But some of these countries kind of have an advantage now that technology is so good. They can kind of leapfrog these traditional, you know, slow moving uh, infrastructures and, and slow moving sort of corporate, you know, governance and just sort of be like almost like just a startup nation. You know, innovation can really, you can go from, you know, having a mobile phone to bypassing physical bank locations because people, you know, so they don't have this, this congestion um, and red tape, maybe, so to speak, that developed uh, countries have a little bit when, when they're trying to innovate, right? There's so many different like laws. Sometimes you see with like Uber and Lyft kind of dealing with everything. It's just like, well, if there's no like cab union, you know, in some of these countries, well, we could just create an innovative way to get people around through scooters or cars or whatever without having to deal with a lot of the red tape. I, I would... I'm cautious of that <laughs> just because as long as, you know, the thing is like, yeah, as <laughs> Uber and Lyft though, aren't building the roads, right? Mm, and they're not good like, paying good the point. taxes to build the roads. And so yeah. the, the thing is like, and then we're, we're working in climates that don't have, many of them don't have roads yet. And so you're never going to, you can't leapfrog that. Um, sure, sure, so, sure. I think that that we've got we're still in an operating environment where good governance, good tax base, you know, we take for granted in this country, I think how much um, of that has already been totally subsidized by by the government and by yep. tax. Yep. And, that, and so I think we're always going to run up against a, a, a block to scale if we don't also in in the public goods that enable that kind of innovation to really take off. But I, I mean, I do think though the innovation economy like is, I think it's, it's happening quicker. We're seeing those sorts of things happen quicker and people learning faster and serial entrepreneurs showing up quicker. Like, you know, I do think that there's a degree of speediness, but I think we can't forget in there's a lot of public goods infrastructure investing. Sure, yeah. has to also happen. Yeah. That would be my, my only caution there. Well, I would just add in the, the mobile money story is a good example where many banks in Africa saw what happened with them mm -hmm. in Kenya. Right, right. Where the regulations uh, either made sticky or were not changed to make the adoption of mobile money much harder in a lot of other places and to make sure they had more control over that. So. There, there, there have been times 
not just the United States, but overseas where they're sure. ensuring that not only have the public investment, but also the rules of the game um, ensure fair competition. I think it's always going to be an important battle. And I think as impact investors, part of the challenge for the next decade is to make sure, even as we continue to try to invest in more companies that have a, a positive purpose, we also are paying attention to, are we, are we weighing in to ensure market rules are fair and efficient and create competition? And are we weighing in to make sure the public investment's there to ensure the economy is growing equitably? And if we're not doing those other two pieces, just making sure we're doing more with our own portfolio is a little like investing your head in the sand where you're, you're not really paying attention to what's going around you and, and uh, you're not creating an ecosystem that's going to thrive over the long term. So we, we talked a, a bunch about a ton of different things. I'd like to, I'd like to jump into to climate change a little bit and, and sort of what's happening in climate tech is, is a bit inspiring and optimistic for sure. What do you see sort of in the, in the climate sector as you know, opportunities that are, you know, again, I think a lot of this stuff is, is really new, right? There's just these new sectors like popping up, right? Like FinTech in Africa, you know, 50, even 15, 20 years ago was not even like a term, right? Like it wasn't even a, a thing. It's so crazy how things move fast and kind of the same with climate tech. I mean, 20 years ago, you wouldn't even think that that would be even like an industry, right? Let alone yeah. one that's profitable, right? And, and can now change the entire landscape of energy around the world. So what does climate uh, change look like from you know, an investor point of view? Like, what, what are you optimistic about uh, in that sector? Well, I think I think there is a couple of different approaches, and we we take some of these across our portfolio. Is there's the um, kind of the 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 innovation stage, and and looking at you know new sort of new materials, and you know particularly kind of product efficiency uh, that are addressing various aspects that contribute to climate change, and those are what what I do get excited about. And particularly in the impact investing, investing space, is that oftentimes traditional venture capital has shied away from hard tech, clean tech, <laughs> because you know it's not based on yeah. animals and it's not based on um, on on SaaS, right? And so, <laughs> basically, it, with the exception of Nest, you know, there's 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 not it's tough for traditional VC to get into that space. But I think what people are starting to see now, when you can sort of combine a slightly longer time horizon with, yes, I mean, a bit more patience to really test out these science experiments, the, you know, it's a little more like biotech investing, essentially, where the payoff could be enormous if you figure out um, something that has, you know, a, a 10x efficiency. And so I, I get excited about that because usually VCs would really like, I mean, five years ago would sort of run screaming if you said anything. <laughs> tech. So I think that attitude is really changing and I think that's wonderful. And then, you know, when we look to other parts of our portfolio as well, there's some fairly straightforward, not so risky things around just sort of financing solutions that we know work already and are fairly commoditized. So, you know, we know what it costs to run a solar farm, a utility scale solar farm. And so financing that and underwriting those deals is relatively straightforward and there's lots of opportunity to do that. And so we like underwriting deals like that. And, you know, there's all kinds of, I mean, interesting things around sort of conservation finance, forestry funds, you know, lots of different things in other asset classes as well, outside of the innovation space, but more on the kind of deploying solutions we know work or mitigation. I would just just add to that. When we think about investing in climate, we think about doing the investment work and we think about also the rule changes that we should be advocating for. Mm-hmm. We should have a carbon tax, right? Yep. Uh, and there, there should be a, uh, a more efficient market um, that puts a price on carbon because otherwise you know, the public picks up the tab for the pollution and we pay the price in climate change. So we do need to make sure that we're, even as we're doing the investment work, we're also creating rules that create more efficient markets and, and incentivize even more investing for solutions. So that's, that's part of our focus as well. And then, and then beyond that, we even get involved in uh, encouraging young people to show up and vote because guess who's the most pro climate, you know, uh, reform generation. It's the, you know, Gen Zers and the millennials. And so we want to make sure as many of them are showing up at the polls and, and electing politicians who are, 
who are going to make sure that we we have fair market rules um, that promote renewable energy. So that's a big part of our work as well. To uh, and it's it's not separate from our investment work in the sense that we right. it's important that we create healthy markets for the long term. It's not just about the investment opportunities today, but we want our kids to not only grow up in a healthy, safe world, but ones where they're uh, able to uh, also invest in positive solutions and be part of an economy that the rules where the rules reward uh, solutions based investing. What would the carbon tax look like? Like how would that that work? I mean, you would just you'd have to be able to track your your sort of emissions and then it would just be your tax based on uh, your emissions, like your tax on your income. Something yeah, there like are that. a lot of proposals for it. I should say, just to take a further step back, there's a lot of work needed in research sure. and yeah. Yeah. infrastructure investment and creating better rule structures for building codes and all that's super important that are about the full transformation of our economy. Carbon tax is just one piece of it. Some of the more popular proposals include taking the uh, amount raised through the carbon tax and actually redistributing it so everybody gets a check every year mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's in January for the amount that's going to be raised through the, through the rest of the year. And that can help uh, mitigate some of the effects on, on folks who have, would face more economic consequences from it, who are lower income mm-hmm. or derive more of their income from transportation industries. So that, that's been a popular solution. There's also been solutions around that where the funds go to kind of a, a stakeholder controlled fund and get reinvested in things that grow the economy even faster, like affordable housing and other community-based uh, businesses. So there's that approach as well. And I think it's, you know, we don't want to micromanage kind of which approach is best. We just want to mostly want to advocate for, you know, creating a more efficient market there. Deals or anything sort of comes across your, your desk, so to speak. And what, what are you looking for? Do you first look at, you know, the company and, and then the idea, uh, of course, right? Um, but then, you know, how much stock goes into the founder and, and sort of the team, right? Is, is, there, is there deep sort of like discussions like this, right, with, with, the, with the, the founding team? Or is it, you know, somebody that you trust might, you know, bring you something really interesting and you trust them so much that, you know, you'll fund, you'll fund it based on, you know, that trust with them? Or, or do with every deal, like, you, you, you know, you really want to talk to the founder and the founding team to, to get their idea and vision? So with the with our venture portfolio, so our direct investments into right. early stage companies, I mean, yes, there's often not a lot of information sure. in the process. And so, you know, obviously we look at any financial information we have, we talk to customers, we talk to, you know, if there are any existing investors, we talk to board members if there are any, mm-hmm. and run this sort of operational due diligence visit, you know, the, the head office, see their work in the field, um, talk to sales agents, you know, do, do sort of all the kind of traditional due diligence and, and also spend a lot of time with, with the founding team, um, which is often really what you're assessing right. in the early days. Uh, but then, I mean, a lot of what we're looking at, though, from, from the investment standpoint is, and I guess, I mean, we, we, I think we're looking at similar things to any other VC, but what might make us a little bit different is that what is the social or environmental impact of this company? Mm-hmm. What is it of whatever, whether it's a product or whether it's a service, like what is that impact? Does the founder agree with that? Like, right. is that part of their goal? Are we aligned on that? And also, is that impact embedded in the business model? So basically, what we are always looking for is companies or investment strategies where the more of whatever it is they sell, the bigger the impact is. And so the, the basically the financial metrics and the impact metrics are tied together and they grow together lockstep on the graphs. And so that's, that's the holy grail of the sorts of businesses that we're looking at. And so the degree to which those two things are tied is very much a big part of our due diligence and trying to, to have the foresight. And of course, you know, I mean, you know, you've talked to and so many like, you, you know, you can't make up some of the pivots that the <laughs> right. companies have to go through. Like, <laughs> of course, you don't have a crystal ball, but can we foresee 
big risks around decoupling the financial performance from the impact performance. And if so, that's not a great fit for us. And so that's that what I would say would be the extra lens that we use beyond what any traditional VC would say. Uh, I'll end on, on two more two more questions. And, and so the first would be, um, you know, looking at the United States and sort of issues that, that we have, and I'm sure maybe you feel the same way and entrepreneurship and, and specifically this transition to sort of impact entrepreneurship can solve not only a lot of the global problems, but but here in America, I think can solve a lot of the, the problems as well. You know, so just concentrating on the, the U.S. for a second, what what are you what are you seeing from, you know, the founders in America and, and the, the issues that we face? You know, how can impact investors and impact entrepreneurs like come together in the United States to solve you know some of our issues, whether it's you know food insecurity, whether it's poverty, whether it's affordable housing whether it's climate, like, like we chatted about earlier, or, or access to education and the digital gap and the digital divide. You know, what, what are you seeing or what are you optimistic about from the you know, United States point of view? Uh, I mean, I have... <laughs> the sigh. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I mean, I have an answer that is, is not, it's probably going to be very unpopular, but it's still, I'll, I'll go for it anyway. I think some of it is is actually, there's what what can they do, but also what sort of, what, what can they not do too? Like, like sometimes it's not about, you know, setting up a new $10 billion climate fund, just pay your workers a little bit more or pay your taxes or do, you know, like, I think sometimes investing. Such a great point. Such a great point. There's been an oversight around investing in, like sort of reinvesting in a country that is going to help you achieve more. It's like we've lost so so much faith in what we do together when we do good, like when we do big things together, when we have you know, really well-funded R&D programs, right? We end up with the internet. Like we, mm-hmm. we end up right. with an entrepreneur's can take the ball and absolutely run with it. And so I think that having a little bit of faith in reinvesting in public goods, whether it's through taxes um, or whether it's through not lobbying against reinvest, you know, against regulation, I I think you're losing the long-term play that will add value to your company. But of course, that's not necessarily how CEOs are incentivized, is how your company will do in 50 years. It's certainly not. So right. I think I, I, I get it, like I see it, but I, I wish that I wish that there was a little bit more acknowledgement that when our country does better, we do better too. Mostly speaking, essentially, unless you're Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the way I like to think about it is that, you know, impact investing can be great at improving technical solutions and service delivery solutions. It on its own is not always great at platform level or network wide solutions. So we should have rural broadband access across the country. And if we did, there would be a lot more great businesses being developed across the country. So, and we should have universal childcare because that would you know, really unlock the potential of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who are torn between their yep. starting a new business and taking care for their kids, you know, a lot of them are women and women of color too. So a lot of it's about creating a playing field that where we all can flourish as, as workers, as entrepreneurs, as educators, and as citizens, and ensuring in addition to like doing the thing of building the business in front of us, we're also participating in build, building that playing field that's going to work better for us down the road. And, um, and, you know, the United States story has been at its best when it's invested in the potential of as many Americans as possible, as opposed to just a small number of Americans. We've had higher growth rates, we've had more equitable growth, the more we've invested across the country. And I think that's more true now than ever before, where, you know, we do have historic inequality in, in this country now. And so, part of impact investing is doing the investing, but there's also recognition. If you're super successful, you know, if you've built that uh, business that's, that's uh, ensured you have permanent financial security, you know, there's an aspect to one of the 
things you can also do is ensure you're paying it forward, not just through your philanthropy, but you know, taxation, yep. Yep. some kind of moderate wealth tax is definitely called for these days and would, would unlock economic opportunity and would be good for us as a family in terms of creating a better investment climate down the road with more yep. competition and more people starting small businesses and uh, more of that infrastructure we need. So we think it's really a both and uh, situation in terms of what it means to, to unlock impact investing in this country. It's like doing the work and advocating for a playing field that where more great work can get done. Yeah, I was, I thought a really interesting thing is it, like, I think it was just a, it was a great point where it's just like, there's these, you know, you don't have to make these grandiose gestures, right, to prove that you're investing in whether it's, you know, energy or, or climate or, uh, or food or, or whatever it may be, right? Like, you can just like, treat workers better, right? Or like, have like an amazing reskilling program, right? Or right. invest in rural areas, invest in, you know, laptops for, for every kid and, and, and sort of work in adult in America, right? There's these there's almost these like little baseline and fundamental things that we just kind of skip over and we want to just go for like the great press release, which, you know, obviously I, I get that and understand it. Right. But it's like, there are some very simplistic things and, and moves that, that we can do. And I thought a, a really good thing that I think is, is being thought about is, is Airbnb looks like they're going to I mean, go public this year or like earlier next year. And I think one of the things that are mulling over is, is figuring out a way to, to actually give shares to the company for their hosts. Right. You know, and that's like a thing where that's a really, really impactful thing, <laughs> right? For these, these, these uh, hosts that have made your platform, you know, 50, $50 billion company, market cap or whatever it's going to be, right? And sort of rewarding them in a way maybe where, just like you said, different ways to make impact, not necessarily these $10 billion funds that you just yeah. never know what, what's going to that's going to happen with that, you know? Yeah, I, I think things like that are where I, I got excited, where we start yeah. more innovation around how we can share in these sort of growth stories instead of let's have three people make lots of money mm -hmm. and, yeah. then, and then give it away in very haphazard ways. <laughs> right. No, you're, you're totally, you're to I always say this is the amount of money wasted in charity and NGOs and the amount of money wasted in invested in really bad startups. Oh my all god! Our, all our world's problems would be probably yeah. solved. <laughs> that that's why, and the waste from from a government level too. That's why oh, I like the allocation sure. of yeah. the the allocation of capital is is such it's such an important yeah you know thing. And it's you know no pressure right, but you guys have one of the most important jobs in the world, right? And I think that that <laughs> is uh, you know that is such a it's a prideful thing though too, right? I think better allocators of money is, is really where a lot of change can happen. And, and the elimination of waste in not only government, but you know, NGO charities and, and obviously with venture, right? The, the whiffs have been made there have been just staggering. So I, <laughs> I digress a little on that. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll end on, on, on the last question and, and it's hopefully a more positive one is let's look at you know, the Blue Haven Initiative from a decade from now, right? And where are some of the the goals or successes that you would want to achieve, right? If you guys, you know, have a glass of wine, wine or something over a conversation, like what is, what is the long-term, you know, goals and successes for the initiative as a whole? Oh, I mean, there's, you know, there's personal and, you know, and sort of community and societal different kinds of goals. Um, but I mean, I'll just, I guess I'll, I'll just start with a very, very personal one which is I hope that my kids are proud of the investments we've made. Like pretty simply, that's a really good litmus mm. test yeah. for me of, you know, would they look back and say, you know, mama, how could you? Or would they say, hey, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Tell me more about what that did. And that's, I'll just, I'll leave on that note. <laughs> I would just compliment that by saying, I think it's all about the learning and seeing how much we can learn in the next 10 years and uh, how much of that at the end of the day we feel is also worth passing on to our kids. And if you don't feel it's worth passing on to your kids, maybe we haven't learned enough. So I think there's an aspect of not just stewarding financial resources, but uh, building up learnings that can drive a family to try to be as helpful as possible. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Liesl. Thanks so much, Ian. It's uh, really amazing. I think everything we talked about, I think is, I hope everybody can, can take 
you know, something out of it and, and look at things a little differently. And I think, I think we all have to be optimistic in a lot of ways. And I'm very bullish on global impact entrepreneurship. And as we talked about it a little before, I think there's parts of the world that are really inspiring and doing some amazing things. And I, I think there's so many more creators around the world and, you know, entrepreneurs that are, are going to make some really special things happen. And now that technology is touching a lot of part, parts of the world, I think it's, it's only going to take it at, at a light speed level. And, and I think we need, like we said, allocators of capital to, to find and, and invest and have a long-term approach with a lot of this stuff. Um, so I appreciate for everything you do. And, and I, I love the point of, of you know, making your kids happy. You guys are very, 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 very smart parents. I, I think that's a really interesting way to look at <laughs> oh, <laughs> investment <okay>. approach. <laughs> 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 <laughs>